Uh, we are talking about generosity and giving today, and, and I want to just give you a few things. If you're a guest with us this morning, maybe it's your first time, you're like, oh, of course, go to church, talk about money. Um, let, let me walk through my heart on a few things for you that may help. Um, we at Real Life Church, we've never, ever spoke to need. At any point, we've been around 12 years, 10 years in Mountain Home, two years before that, and flipping. Um, at any point, we've never said, we need you to give. That's not what we do. Uh, if you study the Bible, you know that one of the names of God is Jehovah Jireh. He is the, my provider. In other words, God is enough. If I have God, I'm good. So when you're here today, understand that, that it's not a money thing, that I don't... The Real Life Church doesn't need your money. In fact, I will challenge you with this as you go forward. If you ever get into a church situation where a pastor or a teacher begins to teach to you about money or generosity from the church's standpoint, and they start with need before they start with obedience, they've missed it. They've just missed it completely. If they start with what they need, and that comes before what God calls us to do, that's a problem. All right, and so as we talk through today, we're going to have a good time with this because I, I do think that money tends to clinch people up a little bit. We get weird about it because we all have weird thoughts about money. How many of you are really great and amazing at saving money? If that's you, hands up. There are always a few of you, but if you, if you are, be proud. All right. How many of you are like, but Pastor Vince, you're asking me a week before Black Friday, and I don't know how I'm going to do this week. <laughs> So it's so funny, Aaron, Pastor Aaron put, I don't know if he announced it or not, but we put all, the, all of our merch from this year that we have left over. Every shirt, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, anything that we have, we just put it on sale for $10 the, the rest of the year. Like it, we want to clear it out, get rid of, rid of it out there. And man, you would have thought <laughs> that, that, that I told him, I was like, good, look at all the clearance people here today. Yeah, and so uh, we. So how many of you are good? Not maybe not not a lot of people good at saving money. How many of you would say you're good at managing your money? More hands. That's good. I don't save a lot of it, but I manage what I have. That's good. How many of you? And this is probably the funnest category. How many? I know funnest isn't a word, but leave me alone, <laughs> teachers in the house. How many of you are good at spending money? Yeah. Let me ask, how many of you struggle spending money? Yeah, that's okay. There are some people out there, and, and I know for those of you that are good at it, you don't understand these people. And when they walk by and they go, ooh, that would be, nah, I just don't think I can. I know I have enough money, but I don't think it's a good idea. Maybe, it, maybe it's a good idea, but maybe, and they just do this, and I know you're like, throw in the card. <laughs> I'll regret it in the parking lot, but I'm making the decision now. All right, so money is, is odd. And, and it's, it's a thing, and, and again, the church has not done a great job of just teaching it, just talking through it. Last week, we talked about the principle of investment, that we invest what, we, what we're excited about. We, we celebrate the things that we invest in. And, and so we talked about the church, the, the, the mission of the church being something that you invest in. It's not an expense. It's an investment into the kingdom. And so we talked about that last week. Today, I'm going to just talk about two principles of giving. Two kind of requirements of giving throughout the entirety of Scripture. There are two requirements of giving. And, and so I want to teach these things so that you don't keep running into what we talked about last week of either being guilted to give where a preacher or somebody stands up and says, if you don't give, and you start to feel bad about it to where you just give because you have to. The Bible talks about when we give out of obligation rather than a cheerful heart, there's an issue there. Or you've been overpromised, where because you gave this, God's going to back a dump truck of money up to your front porch and unload it. Praise Jesus. Man, I'm just going to tell you, that'd be a lot more fun to preach if it held water. It just doesn't hold water. And so I, I want to make sure that you get the proper teaching. And so I, I want to talk to you today about this. Now, before I get into the sermon, let's just talk a little bit. How many of you are super excited about Thanksgiving coming up? Half of you. How many of you are hosting Thanksgiving at your home this week and are stressed? Okay, yeah. 
How many of you got family coming? You got, how many of you are going to be around family this week and it's going to be awesome? How many of you are going to be around family this week and you know there's going to be a fight? <laughs> yeah. Man, aren't we great? <laughs> yeah, we are fantastic. We always do Thanksgiving. We, we haven't always done Thanksgiving at our house. Um, my mom, before she passed, Thanksgiving was... It's kind of always been just our holiday. We, we do Christmas together as much as we can. We try to get together, but Thanksgiving is kind of the non-negotiable. And it was that way for my mom. We, we traveled to my mom's house in Ohio when, when she and my dad lived up there. And uh, we, we all made the trip in because Thanksgiving was that she wanted the big dinner, big dinner. And so my mom and dad, they had four kids, my, myself, my two brothers, and my sister, and all of us have kids. And, and so like my mom loved that we all came to her house for Thanksgiving. It's kind of her thing. And we all had to travel in because they lived in Ohio and we all lived in Arkansas. And so we all traveled in and it was, it was pallets everywhere and you had all the grandkids all, all in this room and all the, the, the grandsons in this room, the granddaughters upstairs in this room and pallets. Every, how many of you grew up in pallets, on pallets? That, you know, six blankets on the floor, one small Afghan too short for you, you know. And you got this, the horrible throw pillow off the couch that was only this big and you're like, this is awful. But... That was what we had, and so just before my mom passed, she was in Cleveland Clinic, and I got to go up and spend about a week with her, and just me and her in the room, and my dad, and uh, so we began to talk, and she said, uh, she said, you got to keep it going. I'm like, keep what going? She's like, Thanksgiving. I'm like, Mom, you are amazing. But Thanksgiving's not going to stop because you pass away. That's not how that works, and she just smirked at me. She said, you have to keep Thanksgiving going. I'm like, Okay. But see, by this time, everybody lived in Arkansas. My mom and dad lived in Arkansas, which is great. And so she said, but you had to keep it going. I'm like, yeah, we'll keep it going. We'll keep having dinner. We're, that's not going to stop, Mom. We're all going to get together. We love each other. We're going to do Thanksgiving. We're going to do it right. She said, but they all have to stay. <laughs> stay stay where, Mom? <laughs> and so literally, the last couple of years of Thanksgiving, we start on Wednesday, and we do a big food snack thing. Uh, we're doing burgers this Wednesday, and everybody's going to make their own burger with weird toppings and fun stuff. We just all get together, and we laugh. Last year, Dallas smoked a pork tenderloin, and it got done about 1.30 a.m., <laughs> We hadn't learned timing yet on food. <laughs> and so you all know it's, it's always better, right, when you pull it off. So we all ate pork tenderloin at 1.30 in the morning as we were getting ready for th So we eat the whole time we're together, but it's just this great time. But every, I mean, literally, we kick kids out of their beds and throw them on a pallet on a couch. And brother, they, li they live less than two miles from our house, but we all stay together. And it's something my, my mom always wanted. So I love Thanksgiving. I love this season where we all get to come together as family, but I also know for some people that holidays are hard, and especially after the last couple of years, holidays are tough. And to you, I just want to say, there's always a seat at the table, and that there is, there is prayer for you and hope for you, and I'm sorry that this season is tough, but I'm also thankful that God still blesses us with these seasons. So remember each other as you walk through this holiday season. I want to dive into this because, and I say all that to set this up, um, Two of the principles that I'm going to talk to you about today, one of them, I'm just going to start it by this, by saying this. I love fudge. How many, any fudge lovers in the house? My mom always made fudge. In the last couple of years, I've tried to make fudge. I have, I've attempted to make fudge. And it's not bad. I, 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 I go and I do it like I thought I knew how to do it. So like I go and I get the Jet Puff marshmallow cream. And on the side of it, Jet Puff's Dreamy Chocolate Fudge. And I make the fudge to that. Now, I do my best to make the fudge to that. This year, I already went and got my ingredients, and we'll make the fudge. Now, fudge is tricky because you can't get it too hot or you'll burn it. You can't leave it too long or it turns into this big, runny pool of chocolate, which is not fudge. It's still awesome. 
but it's not fudge. It's not set up. It's not, it, you can't, and, and man, my mom used to make peanut butter fudge and, and chocolate fudge and then with walnuts, without walnuts in it, and, and I love fudge. So the last several years, I've really attempted to make fudge, and I'm like, this is going to be the year. I'm going to make it this year, and it's going to taste like mom's fudge. So the other day, we were at my dad's house, and my, me and Jennifer were sitting there, and my sister was there. We were talking about it, and Jennifer asked my sister and said, do you make fudge? And Carrie said, yeah, I like mom's. And I said, well, I've been trying to make fudge like mom's. I got the Jet Puff marshmallow cream. I got the, and my sister started laughing. She said, what? I said, the Jet, she said, you don't use the bag of marshmallows and the stick of butter and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What is, did you bump your head? And she started laughing. And I said, what? She said, Mom never used Jet Puff in her fudge. She always kept it on the second shelf so we would eat that and stay out of her way in the kitchen. It's real funny. And so she started walking through that my mom made her fudge from scratch. And I was, made, I was doing the shortcut. And so for the last several years, I've been attempting to get a product in my home and I've been doing the process all wrong. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have any of you ever done that before? You try to get a certain product, but the process is all wrong? Well, now let me talk about generosity and giving in the church. Because some of you right now have been expecting a product from God, but you've been getting the process all wrong. You've been walking through different steps at different times out of order, and you're wondering why it isn't making sense. Or you're wondering why God isn't blessing you like everybody says. He, I, I'm giving to God, so why isn't he blessing me? I'm showing up in church, so why isn't he blessing me? I'm trying to not cuss so much, so why isn't he blessing me? And so we start walking through this, and, and I preached a sermon several years back called The Problem is the Pattern. But I think it's really true in regards to giving. When you see giving in the New Testament, when you see giving in the Old Testament, there is a pattern process to it that I think we have to grasp. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 4. It's right in the beginning of the book. If you don't know where Genesis is, <laughs> open the first couple pages and you're there. All right? And flip two more pages and you'll be in Genesis chapter 4. Now from the very beginning, God sets up a standard. He creates Adam, he creates Eve, and then he sets up a standard. Everything in this garden, everything in this garden, you can eat. Except that one. Why can't we eat that one? Because I said so, and I'm God, and I get to say that. How many of you parents are so thankful that that, that is in your repertoire, that you can say, because I said so? And you see your kids go, oh, and we still get to go, mm-hmm. That's all you're getting, because I said so. God said, don't eat that tree. You can eat anything else. I don't know how big the garden was, but you can eat anything else in it. Don't eat that tree. Why? Because I'm God. You're not. I said so. God knew why, obviously. Then they got duped into trying it, even though they knew better. They took it. You guys know the story. Four chapters later, two chapters later, actually, we pick up the story. Genesis chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. No questions about that process, right? Everybody's good on that? Understands that? Good? When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. Now, when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. Here's the verse I want you to get. When it was time for harvest, Cain presented, what does it say? Yes. Of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Now we pick up. Abel, in verse 4, also brought a gift. The best portion of the firstborn lambs from his flock. 
the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. I want to just kind of walk through this a little bit. Because here's the thing I want you to understand in regards to giving. Church giving, tithing, offering, whatever you want to put on it. Generosity. Order matters. The order and the process matter. Because the order and the process speak to the product. It matters. How many of you know order matters in everything? How many of you have ever made a bowl of cereal? How many of you know that you can't put the milk in first? (laughs) Wait a minute. Is there anyone in the room that actually puts the milk in first? Don't do it. Oh, you do. Oh, no. You're calling them out right here. Just. How many of you, listen, when you put your socks and shoes on, how many of you go sock, shoe, sock, shoe, or do you go sock, sock, shoe, shoe? Sock, sock, shoe, shoe, raise your hand. Sock, shoe, sock, shoe, raise your hand. Sinners. I don't even understand that. There's processes, right? And they matter. How many of you drink coffee in the morning? How many of you start it the night before so it's already brewing when you wake up in the morning? Okay, I got some of you hardcore people. How many of you have to have it black, strong, spoons standing up in it, growling at you when you pour it? How many of you like it a little weaker with some sweet stuff in it? How many of you just would rather have like a cup of milk with a few shots of coffee? Okay. Okay. You know what each of those things take is a process to get it where you like it. God really calls Cain and Abel out here on their process. It's not that they gave. Everybody's fine that they gave. In fact, if we were to read this in today's culture, we would be upset about God. Well, it says that Cain gave some of his stuff. He had something. He gave some to God. That's good enough, right? Well, how come God liked Abel's more than he liked Cain's? That's just not fair. Everybody pretty clear, right, that, that God's not fair. It's weird, right? See, the culture we've been raised in teaches us that everything should be fair. And yet, God, the creator of it all, is not fair. I can tell in the room, some of you are wrestling with this, because this is what, like... No, 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 God's, God's got to be fair. He's the judge of everything. He's got to be fair. Let me clarify. If God were fair, we'd all be dead already. If God were fair, heaven wouldn't even be an option for you or I. It'd only be hell. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's not me. That's biblical reference right there. We don't get to argue that. And so it's not about being fair. God's grace is where we lean, and we're thankful for his graciousness. But when we read about Cain and Abel, we go, but Cain gave some, so shouldn't God be okay with that? Let me ask you this, parents in the house, if your kid cleans some of their room, is the job complete? Is it what you ask them to do? How many of you have kids that when you tell them to clean the kitchen, what they hear is do only the dishes and don't touch anything else? (laughs) Yes. I don't even understand. Clean the kitchen. I did. No, you washed four glasses. Well, they were in the kitchen. (laughs) Some of you feel my, my, you feel this, right? (laughs) I've seen a mom in the house like, thank you, Jesus. There's a process, and the process matters. Now here, if you look at another translation, the Septuagint, the Old Testament, what you see here is that God actually states, Cain, you have rightly given, you have not rightly divided. God said, it's not about what you gave. It's about how you gave it. Abel gave what was first. You gave some of what you had. And we struggle with this 
because we believe that we've been blessed enough to make the money, make our resources, have our resources. As long as I give God some, he should be good. But you misunderstand his seat. He's God. He gets what's first. That's why the whole first fruit thing comes out in the whole entirety of the Old Testament. And then even Jesus amplifies it in the New Testament and says, you ought not just give God what's first. You ought to give him everything. Boy, we don't want to teach that one. That makes everybody tense. The reality is this. Abel, his gift, I've heard people teach it, and they go, well, Abel was a, a shepherd, and so God really appreciated the meat offering more than he appreciated the vegetable offering. God has never asked you to give something you didn't have. At any point, he knows you. He knows what you've been blessed with. He knows the resource that you have. He wasn't upset because Cain had a vegetable or harvest offering. He was upset because he didn't give what was first. He didn't give the best out of it. Abel said, here's my firstborn sheep. Let me get the best ones in the stock and give those to God, and he'll bless me with what's left. And so we have to understand that the process matters in our life. When we see this, and here's why it matters in our life, because the moment we take God out of that seat and we make him a God of some rather than a God of all and a God of first, is that sin will begin to sneak in. This is actually how it follows up, and he says this in verse 6. God says, Cain, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry, asked God? Why do you look so dejected? In the, in the King James, he asked, why has your face fallen? If you would have done what was right, you'd be accepted. But because you didn't, you refused to do what's right. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Sin is crouching at your door. Sin is waiting for you to put me second or third so that it can become first. And the moment it becomes first, I quickly fall off the chart altogether. So God knows the pattern in our life. Most of us have done this in some way or another. Let's just set money aside for a second. Most of us have tried to fix problems in our life only to go to God when there's nothing left. Can I get an amen? Amen. We may not want to admit it, but it's true of all of us. I'm a control freak like most of the human race. Where we go, I can fix this, I can fix this, I can handle it, I got this, I don't want to bother God with this. And God says, no, 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 you're not bothering me with it. It's what I do. It's, it's, what, it's what I created you for was to lean into me, was in, to trust in me, to believe that I truly am your provider. That's what I created you to do. You coming to me with this is not a problem. It's what I want. How many of you parents in the house would say, if my kids would just come and ask, I could give them so much help? But we also reach that point where we don't want to ask anybody. And God understands because we do the same thing with him. That's why he says it's critical that you keep me first. If you keep me first, then this won't happen. This won't happen. So the order matters in your life. When you get paid, when you have health, when you've been blessed in your life, the first thing we ought to think of is God. The first thing we ought to think of is God. Why? Because he's God and he, because of him, all the rest of it happens. Matthew chapter 6 tells us it's very popular. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. All of what things? Your clothes, your food, your provision, your health, your wellness. All of those things will be added to you. Well, I want all those things. Then put God first. It ought to be natural for us as believers. If I'm blessed, I don't go, ooh, look at how much I did. If I'm blessed, I ought to go, God, thank you for allowing me to do what you've allowed me to do. God, thank you for blessing me with the ability to do what you've blessed me with the ability to do. Thank you for putting me in this position, in this time, in this season, for this moment. My son and I, Braden, just started a job on the road this, this last week. We were talking a couple weeks ago, and, and we were talking through the reality, and he's like, Dad, I love to work. I love to work. 
And he said this at the table. I'm not going to get too much into it, but he said at the table, he said, if I could work and then sleep and then get up and go to work again, that's what I want to do. I just love to work. Those were your words, right, buddy? <laughs> this last week, he got a new job, and he worked 96 hours. <laughs> we were talking yesterday, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, you got to be careful what you say out loud. God, hear that stuff and put you in it. But the reality is, no matter what it is in your life, which don't be surprised that God actually shows up as God in your life when you ask him to show up as God in your life. But when he shows up as God in your life, don't forget him. Don't put it off like he didn't do it and it was all you, because you didn't. There's not any of us that live there. So the order matters. When we've been blessed, God goes first. When I look at all of my kids and my grandbaby, and I look at what God has blessed me with as far as my children, as far as my grandchild, as far as my son-in-law, I go, man, I've been so blessed. But do you know who I see first when I look at all of them? It's Jennifer. It's my wife. When I see any of them, I see her because none of them would have been possible without her in my life. The blessing in your life comes directly, not from you and your greatness, but from God and his provision. So get the order right. Last thing, and I'm going to be really quick here. The heart of the house should be generosity. Not only this house as far as our church, because we have a generous heart. Next week, we're going to challenge it. Straight up, we're gonna, there are going to be gift tags out there in the foyer. We've got our, our gifts coming in, our list from the kids in the school district that aren't going to have Christmas this year or much of a Christmas until real life church shows up. And those that have been around you know we show up. Not because we have to, but because we have a generous heart. But the heart of your house, the heart of this, this house, your temple, is it truly for generosity? Is it cheerful giving or is it out of obligation? I want you to hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He's talking to the church at Corinth who is loaded. This church is in one of the largest communities in Rome or in this area right now. It is, it is one of, it's running about 500,000 in population. The city is, and the church is thriving. But he doesn't write to them about them. He writes to them about a little church in the region of Macedonia. And this is what he says. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles. And they are very poor. But they are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Do you see where generosity comes out of? It comes out of joy for what God has done in your life. Because God has protected us in trial, I've got joy and it overflows out of me. Because God has been there when it's been awful, I have joy. Because on the days that it sucked, God was there and he got me through it and I have joy because of it. And it overflowed in rich generosity. And then he says in verse three, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will, not because the preacher stepped up and said, we need, but because the joy of God was in them. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They said, we want to know how we can help. We want to know how we can help. Paul said, you've done enough. You're struggling right now. No, no, no. We want to know how we can help. We want to know how we can be involved. How can we be a part? How can we give back? That was their heart. That was the heart of their house. That heart of generosity. They even did more than we hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us. Just as God wanted them to. Chapter 9 of Corinthians, Paul leans into this further and he says, For God loves what kind of giver? That word cheerful there is the Greek word from which we get our word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. People go, well, I, I, 
I don't know that I've ever given and laughed about it. And I don't know if you've given right. When you've been able to just be blessed because of what God allowed you to do. Man, I don't know if you've ever done the pay it forward thing where you bought somebody's meal and it actually shocked them. And you look in the rearview mirror behind you and they're confused when they're talking to the lady in the window. Like, what? No, 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 no. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? We, one of our first outreaches at Real Life in Mount, and when we were in Flippin' was we went to a gas station and we just bought gas for people. As they pulled up to the pump, we walked out to the pump and we were like, hey, hold up. How much did you get? I just filled it up, $53. Sweet, hey, I'm going to go pay for that for you. No, 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 no. You're not going to do that. I'm like, no, really, I just want to pay for it. I just want to pay for your gas for you. No. No? No. Please? Can I pay for your gas for you? Why? Because I just want to pay for your gas for you, I promise. No. That can't be it. There's got to be a string. No, you don't understand. There's no string. I just want to give you $53. I just want to pay for your gas. Can I just please pay for your gas? I'm in an argument trying to give somebody $53. Finally, so many people said no to us that I just went into the clerk and I said, here's $500 from Real Life Church. When anybody comes in to pay for their gas, just pay for it, please. Tell them it's already been paid for. Because people refused it. They didn't understand it. Man, we had a ball. We sat and watched them. They'd walk out going, I don't want the... They're looking around, who paid for my gas? And we're sitting in the car laughing going, we know God did. God got to be a part of that. And I don't care if you know my name. I don't care if you know which church did it. It doesn't matter to me. We got, there's, there is a joy in being generous. You'll see it next week. We see it when we do these gifts and that kid will write, I'd like a pair of socks. Which she better put on sock, sock, shoe, shoe, just to clarify. <laughs> I am still shocked. They're going to ask for a pair of socks and maybe some one that we see a lot is pillows, bed sheets. We'll see high school kids ask for 2T clothes, 4T clothes, because for their Christmas, they want to make sure their little brother or sister's got stuff. And I love it because I see you guys walk in through the week. I see you guys walk in through the week. I've seen you walk in through the week pulling bicycles and stuff out of the car. Somebody's asked for a ball and they'll get a bicycle and books and every ball that you can imagine playing with and we walk into the school and we got three truckloads of gift bags and they go we go where do you want us to put them and now it's got to the point where we get to watch the people at the school start to chuckle they start to laugh when we come in because we just keep coming We've had to borrow the box truck from Nasari's home mortgage in the past to bring all the gifts to the different schools before because you guys show up generosity. That comes from a heart of the house. That comes from somewhere that, that's not in us just as humans, but it's in us because we are never more like Jesus Christ than when we give. Lord, if if it's not your will, then let it pass. But nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. I'm willing to give. And in the very end, Jesus gave. I came so that you might have life. In the very end, his entire being was about giving. And I want us to have the right heart, church. I want you to have the right heart. I want when Mountain Home talks about real life church, I don't care if they mention our worship. I don't care if they mention the preaching. I don't care if they mention the sweet tea. I don't care if they mention anything about this building. Let us be known by our generosity to a community that may not know Jesus. Let us be known by people that go, you know what, I don't know everything about that church, but when it comes time to give, they show up. When it comes time to change the community, they show up. When it comes time to make a difference in someone's life, that church shows up. That's what I want to be said about this church. And that only happens when you and I and everybody around us embraces the heart of the house that says, we're going to be a generous church. 
not that we'd like to be generous, not that we hope that, but we are generous. 